All right. Welcome to this episode of Try Me Talk. We're excited. I'm excited. Um, this week we're going to start. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, somebody who I feel has become a good friend over the years. I, I, I had a chance to meet her originally at um, one of our soft conferences. And for those of you listening that may not have had an opportunity to attend um, the soft conference, that's, uh, if you go to trisomy.org, support organization for families with trisomy is a huge organization that supports the trisomy community. Uh, if you're not, not familiar with it, get familiar with it and learn about the conference. Um, it's really where we all get a chance to meet each other face to face, become friends, become family and really share the Trisomy journey. So go to the website, uh, trisomy.org, when you're done with the webinar, and check out the conference for this year. We're going to be going to Rhode Island. But I originally met Debbie at a conference um, and, and found out about this incredible project. And I'm going to let her tell you all about it. Um, Debbie, I, welcome to the webinar. Appreciate everybody joining us. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, today we have with us Debbie Bruns, who's um, with Southern Illinois University. And she works with a project called the TRIES Project, Tracking Rare Infant Syndrome. Um, I became familiar with her at one of our, our soft conferences. Debbie, we're going to send her over to you to tell us about the project, what it is, um, how it got started, mm -hmm. how you got involved, and just all of that. So over to Debbie Brun. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, um, Terry. And I'll just kind of jump in, and I'll move the PowerPoint along. Um, Terry will help me with the questions uh, that we can answer at the end. And I see from all the folks that are logged in that I know all of you, so this is great. Um, so maybe there will be some new information or there might be some old information, um, but I'm just excited to share it in this format because it's a little bit different than what I'm used to. Um, I think the key piece for me, um, and, and all of you might know this, and or maybe not all the details, is um, I, I kind of came to the TRIES project and the interest in all of this in a different way than all of you. Um, I, I am a parent. I have two kids of my own, neither with a trisomy condition, and that's usually the questions that I get, um, that if I didn't have my own child, then what was my connection? And the photo that you see on this PowerPoint slide are the three little girls that sparked the interest. Um, that I have and continue to have in about trisomy. And um, these three were children I worked with, um, what I think of as my former life, um, before I became an academic when I was a classroom teacher. And um, the girls on either side were in my classroom. The little girl in the middle was actually in the classroom across the hall, but I worked extensively with her on feeding. And that was my introduction to trisomy 18 specifically. I had never worked with a child before with that particular condition. And um, kind of taking a trip back in time, it was the early 90s. So even when I went to look for information, there was very little. Um, the internet was just starting, which, you know, now we look at things in, in 2013 and how did we live without it. Um, but it was just starting. I looked for some information online. And when you're doing, you know, dial up at 2 in the morning, because um, that was the only time you could get some, some bandwidth, as it were, all I basically found were autopsy photos of kids. Um, not very much literature at all, but I would go to work the next day and see these three and try to figure out how to plan for them, how to work with them. Um, they did show many of the, the classic, you know, what we think of as trisomy 18 issues with feeding and, and respiratory problems and so on. But I learned very quickly that all three were very different, um, very different personalities, very different ways of interacting with myself and my staff. And I think, um, maybe I didn't realize it at the time, but it really made an impression on me. So uh, kind of fast forward, when I went back to school to work on my doctorate, I wasn't really sure what I was interested in just yet, but knew that was the direction I wanted to go. And as the um, online communities were growing and the internet really kind of took off, um, I found myself learning about some listservs. And there was one in the late, later in the 90s um, where, and, and some of you know her, um, Karen popped up from Australia and started hearing, you know, about the trials and tribulations with Alex and, you know, just understanding about um, somebody having 18 mosaic versus full 18, which the three girls that I worked with had. And um, around that time, when Karen started the TRI-specific list, um, where 
you know, some, some parents that I've gotten to know from when their kids were very, very young, that's, those are the initial kind of virtual meetings that I had, uh, like with Jude Wolpert, for example. And so I started kind of making connections there. Um, then as I was finishing my doctorate, I was still very interested in all of this, but had kind of gone in a different direction with, with some research, but so looking at medically fragile children for the most part. And got connected um, with Karen, got connected with Dr. Carey, and I think the pieces just started coming together, especially as I was um, being, I guess, more of a lurker, I guess, on the listserv and hearing parents with the same issues over and over again. Um, if there was a prenatal diagnosis, being pressured to terminate the pregnancy. Or um, if the diagnosis came later, the difficulties in getting surgeries for their kids, um, difficulties in just getting services for their kids, like that the whole bleak outlook type of thing. And just looking at it as a researcher, once you start seeing things over and over, we see trends, we see patterns, then we have a little bit more information to actually do something about that. Um, it was also during this time that I got connected with um, Shirley Lockwood, Fauna, um, and she wanted to help out with the project as well. So, and she still is an integral part of the project. So kind of formally and informally, 2005 is where I say things started in terms of planning. Um, but 2007, February 1st, 2007, so we just had our six-year anniversary of the project, is when things started. Um, and that's when officially our online presence started uh, with the full survey online um, for the kids that are two months or older. Later, we added the modified survey. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those. Um, and then we have our follow-up survey, which is the annual follow-up on the children that are living. Um, but again, before things really started off, that, that 2005 to 2007 time was a pilot. Um, and I still have a you know special place in my heart for the parents that were on that tri-family and tri-med um, listserv that I could recruit um, to help me out and do the pilot for our the survey and give me feedback and lots and lots of great um, information, things that I, I had no idea of at that point with medical conditions and so on. So basically there's three surveys, and most of you are familiar with them. Um, we have the full, or what I call the baseline survey, that's for the children living two months or more, and that is a big one. Um, you come in, there's three sections, it goes into lots of detail about the uh, pregnancy, the birth experience all of the conditions that were suspected and confirmed, um, birth information with height and weight. We're actually one of the pieces of data that I'm looking at now with one of my students is we're looking at some of the demographics around maternal age because there's so much talk about parents over 35 and um, issues around genetic conditions. And we are looking at some data um, for parents that have kids with full 13 and full 18 and we see it's not necessarily like that. Um, it's an equal opportunity type of thing. The youngest mom in the project right now um, in the data set we looked at was actually 15, and the oldest mom was 45 with, you know, everyone in between. Anyway, we have so the full survey. The follow-up is the one that uh, you guys all complete annually on kind of the anniversary of completing the full with updates. Uh, to my knowledge, and this is in reading the literature and talking with Dr. Carey and so on, what really truly makes the project unique is the follow-up component, is that we're actually tracking your children over time and being able to put that information together slowly um, to have more of a, a composite picture of care over the long term and that children do indeed live for long periods of time and have changing needs. It's not static. Um, we know just in informally uh, with meeting parents, going to the conference and so on, that there are things that pop up. Seizures might start later. Um, a new feeding issue might start. And then there's also some positives that come with uh, the children that are living longer in, in terms of developmental skills that people don't typically associate with a child with a trisomy. Kids, you know, walking independently, like Natalia, um, kids walking with aided, but they're still getting from one place to another. And that really isn't an expectation that you see in the literature in talking about case studies and so on. Um, the modified survey is the, the third survey. Um, it kind of came at the end where 
it uh, turned out to be really difficult to ask parents of kids with um, babies that were still born or only lived several days to actually fill out the full survey because they didn't have all of that information and would not have it. Uh, so the modified survey is for parents who have a baby that's no longer with us. Um, and what's been interesting in just looking at the numbers of the completions is we have way more full surveys completed than modified. And I think that's also a partly um, the parents will find their way to the project, which is a bias, but I'll take it, just in terms of being able to talk more about um, survivors. So what I wanted to kind of throw out there to you guys is the scope of the project and use um, things to date or things in progress to just kind of give an idea of the scope of things and then also to get some additional feedback from all of you. Um, on other things to look at because there is so much data. I always tell my students that I have data that will keep me busy for 20, 25 years, if not longer, because the whole project is so dynamic. I mean, there's at least 500 families represented now in the database. There are some families that have two children represented in the database. Um, and just because of the follow-up data, the richness, the depth of the data, as I said, will keep me busy in terms of writing up uh, individual children for case studies, which could be your kids, um, if you guys would be interested in doing something like that. Um, I also do the kind of the subgroup studies and so on and that I can share with you. Um, so the first place I was going to jump in and kind of doing things more recent um, to earlier is as of late, um, I've been doing a lot of work with Cheryl Crozier, which is, you guys know, Simon's mom, um, and was actually very closely involved as she started working on the book. And about Simon, I have an afterword on the book, but we also wanted to make sure we reached um, and that's part of the, the scope of the project was so exciting to me is reaching different audiences. So we can go and uh, talk to groups of nurses, um, clinical folks in genetics, and so on. And you know what we're seeing, we're kind of taking it on the road at this point. And we just did a presentation actually like this. Um, we spoke to a group in Delaware over I think about 100. Um, nurses of various types, a lot of NICU nurses and so on, and we came in on a big screen and Cheryl told her story um, with Simon and then I kind of came in and gave some data from the project and talked more about the kids who are long-term survivors and the need for uh, individualized care and things. Um, we were also very excited to have a parent in the audience who had, uh, her child is a toddler now uh, with full 18 and is doing fairly well. So Anna was there in the audience, which was really neat um, to kind of bring that personal piece, and that's what we're going to try to do as Cheryl and I continue. We have a, we have a training that we're going to do actually by, um, by her in St. Louis at the end of March to an audience of nursing students and occupational therapy students. Um, we have another one coming up building the Rockford area of Illinois, which again will be mostly nurses um, in a, a hospital system up there. So we're very excited to do this. Um, what we did in June, what's listed here, was we actually did a poster session at a nursing conference, a national huge nursing conference, and we had a poster set up, and that's actually what's been generating some of our sessions now. Um, but we had a poster that was there for the duration of the conference, and we had certain times we had to be there, and people come, would kind of come in and out and pick up our materials, and it was just amazing to me um, to have these nursing coordinators and NICU nurses and so on stop look at the photos, because I always use photos and everything I do, um, all these photos about Simon, about his care, and they would ask how long did he live. And um, as you guys know, he lived 88 and a half days. And the nurses would say, wow, I, you know, most of the babies I knew didn't make it through birth or only a few days, you know, and so on. And Cheryl and I kind of had it set up like a, almost like a comedy sketch, because then she would turn to me when she talked about Simon being, you know, living for 88 and a half days ago, well, you should ask her about the kids in her project. And that's when I would jump in and say, oh, yeah, well, I've seen kids who are 8 and 18 and 28, um, which I've seen 18 and 13 and so on. And these people's jaws would drop. And again, that's where I feel the importance of the project is to really cast a very wide net, get all kinds of folks involved to, to be able to take, um, take the information about the long-term survivors, also, you know, the kids who were not around as long. I mean, there's a, there's a data set for them as well, and to really be able to celebrate the kids and their accomplishments. Um, some of the other things that I've done, I wanted to kind of pull out some of them. Um, last March, I was able to go to Charlotte, and again, talking just about long-term survivors, had a big old poster, 
had a couple of um, long-term survivors with T18, full T18, full T13. Um, Cam Wolpert was one of the kids I was highlighting, for example. Um, Natalia was on there too. And again, these were clinical genetics folks, and they would come by, look at the photos, and just look at me with disbelief. You know, how old are they? And I'd say, oh, well, she's 14, and this one's 10, and they had never seen a long-term survivor. So again, that's where I feel the, pro the, the project makes the difference, just in being out there, having people see it. Um, that's why on the website for the project, I'm sure you guys have seen, I have photos there all the time. I'm updating photos all the time to really celebrate the kids. Um, the conference that I attended um, in May of 11 was also a poster session. Um, what was really intriguing was it was an international meeting. Um, there were people there literally from all over the world. Um, but interestingly, people would walk through where the posters were set up, take a look at, they couldn't always read the text I had, but they could see the photos, and they'd be pulled in by the photos. And they would point to a child on my board and say, 13 with a question mark. And I'd say, yeah, it's twice 2013. And they would kind of look at me and we would try to have a conversation. And again, I would tell them how old the child was. I would give them um, information about the project. Now, I'm not sure if new families came into the project as a result, but there was still that recognition from those individuals that, look, there's kids. They do survive. Um, and I know we, we kind of have pockets in the project where if I can pull in a parent from a, an international parent, you know, from another country, they can bring in more folks. And um, some of you probably on Facebook know Siri, who's out in Norway. And she has, I think, grabbed all of the families she knows in Norway and had them sign up for the project. And there are, they've all completed their surveys. So there's a little pocket of, of parents um, that are representing kids from Norway. Um, the other piece that I do quite a bit, and I pull my students in as much as I can, is writing. Um, get the Trice Project out there to, again, different audiences, to raise awareness, to you know, refute a lot of that gloom and doom stuff that's out there. So just an example of things that, that I have going on, and you'll see some of these in, in some of the other slides as well. Um, this top one I'm really excited about. This is more of a concept piece. It's not data. But because there's been so much going on in the literature, um, Barb Barlow's been really on top of this. Annie's mom um, talking about giving the kids only comfort care and palliative care because of the diagnosis and so on. And what I've done in this article, which will hopefully be published very, very soon, is really come down on the side of the kids and advocating um, to look at the kids individually. Not to just look at the syndrome and the possible issues, but to look at the possibility of this living, breathing, wonderful little person and provide services. And not only make choices or take away services because of the label. And I think, you know, my background in special education in general really pushes me and um, has me feel very passionate about that topic. So I'm very, very excited to get this one out. Um, what you'll see is there's also a, a manuscript that's under review. We've worked on it a couple of times, also with Cheryl, just to get information out about Simon, again, in a different venue. And that would be a nursing journal, a very practitioner-friendly kind of journal that would get into a lot of people's hands. Uh, the middle one is a, actually came out of a couple questions on Facebook. That's been one of the things that's been happening for me, too, is parents post questions and pull me in to find answers in my data. Um, so this middle study about reflux came from, I think it was Susan was asking questions um, about reflux in kids with full 18. So basically, I went back with, uh, with Stacy, my student who most of you have met. We pulled some of that data out, and we were looking for the numbers of kids um, with reflux, where it was identified early on and then up to the present. And again, these are survivors. And we submitted it to topics in clinical nutrition, so that's a whole different area. Um, it's nutritionists, dietitians, those types of folks who know very little about T18, and we're hoping, kind of fingers crossed, that that will be published as well. Um, these are some of the things that I've uh, had published in the past couple of years, again, focusing on giving folks in the field a bigger picture about the kids and not just, again, the gloom and doom about what's wrong, but also being able to talk about some of the medical conditions and how they resolve themselves, um, talking a little bit more about kids that do, in fact, receive surgery uh, to take care of some of the conditions, that it is a good use of resources, because that's another big buzzword that's going around now as far as the use of resources or not um, for kids with certain types of conditions. Um, What's kind of interesting is the bottom one, that neonatal experiences one. I really 
pushed to get that published. Um, the other two are in actually Dr. Carey's journal, so he's um, worked with me, but it's still gone through the same review process and so on. But that bottom one took three different journals um, to accept it, and I think again it came back to people. There was the first one I sent it to questioned my data almost to the point of asking me if I was making it up, because again I was talking about survivors. Um, this last one, Advances in Neonatal Care, did publish it, but I had to agree um, that there could be an opinion piece that came right after it in the journal and come to find out much later that the person who wrote it is very against care for kids with trisomy 18, 13, and so on. So she had a very biased um, view of some of the things that I wrote about the kids in a very positive light in terms of some of the developmental skills. She, the author turned it around as a very um, negative because the kids were still so dependent on adults and, and so on. So that was a learning experience for me, but I went and did it anyway. Um, these two I'm really proud of because that's a lot of my interest in terms of looking at family support. Um, I've learned a ton about the medical conditions and so on, but I've also been, um, more of my background is about family support and looking at, again, the Kids in the Tries Project in terms of things that are the same and different. And these two publications, and there's still enough data for at least two or three more at this point, in some ways really agrees with what's already out there in terms of talking about um, the, the support needs that parents have in general if they have a child with a disability. But the, the top one that I did with um, Carly Shrey, who again, some of you guys met at the SOFT conference, really um, highlighted some of the things that are unique uh, when we were talking about uh, the, that particular article was talking a lot more about the wage earners in the family and a lot of times mom having to make the decision to stay home with her child with a trisomy and how that affects insurance, how that affects just the daily care type of thing, and what um, the data told us over and over and over again was they could not, um, parents could not find a place for their child because people were either very nervous to take care of a child with this incompatible with life diagnosis, um, or if they kind of got past the diagnosis, it was just, well, I've never, we've never had a child in this child care who has a trach and a G2. And, you know, my thought is when I was in the classroom, I didn't go in knowing how to work with a child with a trach, but I learned. And parents learn how to take care of um, these medical and kind of high-tech needs. So I think everyone else needs to kind of step up and, and learn how to do that as well so parents can have that option. So these, again, are two, two articles I'm really um, happy with. I'm glad that they're out there. Um, if you guys were at the soft conference this past year um, when we were in St. Louis, we collected some data there. We're, we're moving slowly, but we're trying to pull all that together as well um, to put out there. And it was, it was very positive data that we found in terms of, um, you know, families being very positive about having their, their trisomy member with them. Um, I mentioned the concept paper at the beginning. Again, very excited to get that out there. So these are things that are still kind of working through um, the pipeline. Um, there's a couple new things that we're working on as well. The, um, the first one is with my current undergrad assistant. You guys will meet her at the soft conference. Um, we're looking at, at uh, 22 long-term survivors, and that group is actually kids between the ages of 12 and 59 months when uh, parent survey, so their baseline survey. So many of the kids are a bit older at this point. Um, we're also kind of mirroring this, writing up another set of data on kids that started in the project at five years or over. So I'm looking at the list here, and I know at least one or two of you are in that list as well. Um, we're kind of starting out with trisomy 18 because that's our biggest, um, that's the biggest group after Down syndrome just in terms of the numbers. But we are also going to look at data for full and um, full and mosaic 13, and also for nine mosaic. We, we have some data on that group as well. What gets difficult for us is when we have the really small groups, um, like the 9Ps, 9 partials. Not to say we don't want to look at their data, but to do some of the analysis that we do, we need larger numbers, which is why, again, recruitment for the project goes hand in hand with what we can do with the data. Um, but I do know the, uh, the Trisomy 9 Mosaic publication that I had a couple of years back where we talked about 14 kids. Dr. Karen made a point of telling me that that was the largest group that was ever um, published about, which kind of boggles my mind that 14 is such a big number, but I'll take it. Um, but then we want to get more and more people involved. Um, so 
so as I said, ongoing is there's always data to be looked at, and I, I do look to parents to give me ideas and suggestions for things to go into in more detail. I've had the family support data actually started out from data on the survey, and then I developed an additional data collection instrument to go into more detail. And that was partly my interest. That was also partly uh, parent interest in the topic. So if you guys have something you'd like me to look at for a particular group or in general, let me know about that, um, whether here, email, Facebook, wherever, um, and I can see what I can do. Um, turnaround is not always very quick. That's the only problem. It takes a little while to get things done. Like I said, that, that uh, reflux data has been, I'm, I'm really feel bad saying it, but almost two years in the making to get it going and hopefully getting it published, but we're, we're working on it. Um, so it's ongoing. Facebook has been wonderful. Um, I didn't, at first I wasn't very excited about it, but now our, the Tri Project page has over 300 likes. Um, those are not necessarily all 300 families. Sometimes it's family members, so I'll get multiple members of a family liking the page, which is fine. Um, but I do see new people coming on the page who aren't necessarily enrolled in the project. And then I do a shout out about twice a month um, to encourage those folks to enroll. And I do see some of them enrolling in the project and completing their survey. So that's exactly how, um, one of the ways I try to grow the project. Um, and then through SOFT, SOFT has been very good to try, has done some funding for us. Um, we always have a place every year at the conference to do at least a session. This year we're going to do it on the long-term survivors, so we'll have the 18 and 13 data. I'm not sure if we'll have time to get all the nine data together. Um, but the nines are also having their own meeting. So I'll have some other data um, at that meeting, and I'll have my students with me to present that as well. So I'm excited about that. Um, again, just the home page for the project, the enrollment page, but most of you I'm just looking at the list are already in the project, but there it is if, if uh, you need to share it with folks that you've met through the different trisomy communities. Um, and then the Facebook page is listed there, and I do have to give a shout out to Teresa Ann because she helped me a bunch to get that page organized and really getting it um, a lot more views from folks, which has definitely upped the traffic on the page, and I'm trying to keep that going as well. Uh, but if you guys, again, have other ideas of places for me to make connections um, in terms of recruitment, please tell me, because I will do pretty much everything and anything. Um, but as I said, we're at about 500 families at this point, international. Um, it's exciting to see some families that come in um, just unexpected. Um, there's a family from Germany. Actually, the dad's pretty active um, on Facebook. He kind of comes and goes, uh, and he filled out the survey for his daughter, and he's going to try to wind up, you know, round up some other people for me from Germany. Uh, we've talked a little bit about trying to translate the surveys, but again, that's, that becomes a resource issue with, with finances and time and, and finding folks to assist. I've done a little bit of, of translating on the modified survey. Um, most of that is, or about three quarters of that is in translated to Spanish at this point, and there's huge online groups um, where most of the folks speak Spanish. So that's another piece that we're kind of hoping to move toward, but there's lots of, of kind of side projects going on. But again, you know, what I want to leave you with, and again, most of you guys are in the project, is you see the importance of it, and I thank you for um, supporting the project, but it's also telling more people about it, getting more people involved to complete surveys, um, just to, you know, say positive things about the project, let people know about it. And in turn, then we have more data, you know, for us at the project, for all the personnel, to work with that data and get it out there to as many, uh, especially medical professionals, as we can. Because it seems that if you can give people that data and the photos, um, it starts to change minds. It starts to expand people's thinking. They're not just cheering twice in 18 or 13 or 9 mosaic or what have you and thinking negatively and pessimistically is they start remembering that smiling face. They start remembering the developmental progress that the child makes. And then when the next child shows up in their practice or in their hospital, they might be a little bit um, kind of in a better place to take some action and, and be proactive with care rather than restricting their care. So I just want to thank you for letting me walk you through the project. And if you guys have any questions for me or comments, let me know. Thanks. It's really what you're doing. I, ha I, I just have chills to hear you describe it. I mean, I, I, I had an idea what you were doing, mm -hmm. but I really give me chills to know someone that has a full-time life, full-time career, full-time family, <laughs> and you're educating a 
so much of your time and your energy to our children. And truly, I'm just, just in, in, I can hardly speak. I'm so overwhelmed with it. Um, and I, I have the feeling I'm speaking for many of us on the line. And understand that this is going to be seen by many people. We're going to put out here. This is going to help hey. get this project on, mm -hmm. on the road. So here we go. I know I'm going to mention, again, thank you. If you have questions, put them over here on the side. I have a couple of my own. So while you're putting your questions up, I, I will ask a couple of them. And first of all, I will tell you, um, while I listen to you speak, Greek, I have, you know, been wanting to figure out where Tries Me Talk part of its its intention is, and and obviously it's to put the the, the face on on all of this. And I'm so excited to be to to have you share this because I really know we're going to reach more people. Um, so my goal personally is to help expand the project, you know, so that over the next six months we get 50 more kids, 50 more families coming That's out that great. day and not getting. So where they come from, I don't know, but that's, I'm going to put that one out to the universe and let's make that happen because um, I can tell you that when Christina was in the hospital a year ago and we thought we were going to lose her and she came into the hospital in very bad condition, no one that was there really knew her. So all they saw was diagnosis and what they thought was a dying child. And I'll tell you that having this to go to, this resource with what you're doing, um, mm -hmm would have been very helpful, but what was really helpful and what I was thinking about was that you mentioned about the pictures, and they just mm -hmm. saw the diagnosis until we put the wall of photos of Chrissy's life and who Chrissy is on the wall, and I will tell right. you, the energy in the room changed because they walked in the door, and they started to see a child rather than a diagnosis, which of course leads us to tomorrow, but we're still talking about today. So we have some questions right. here. I have a couple more, but I want to get out to... Um, um, so where in the U.S. is your largest concentration of uh, P18 and 13 families? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, that's a good one, Raquel. What, what I've seen, and I would have to go back in the database and double check it, and, and I, I don't know if it's self-serving, but there's a lot of folks in Illinois. And I, again, I don't know if it's because I'm here and I can interact more. Um, when, I, when I was first introduced to families that had a child with a, a trisomy 9 diagnosis, there was a get-together in northern Illinois, and I like grabbed everybody with, that was at that meeting, and they got into the project, and a lot of them were from Illinois. Um, there is a, there is a, a group of uh, TA teens also in Illinois, so I can go back and double-check um, what is listed in my database and just run some frequencies to look at numbers, but I think part of it is a this person told this person, this person told that person. Um, but right now I know there is a large number in Illinois. That would probably be the, the state that comes to mind right off. But it's also a bigger state. So I don't have that many people from West Virginia, let's say, or from Montana. But the, the bigger population states, I think, to draw some folks in. Cool. That's, that, that's good. Well, you know, that area seems to have a lot. Obviously, we have the conference. Those are the conferences I've been anytime I think of anybody. <laughs> it seems like lots of people in that area. Um, okay, I have a question. So on the, the translation that you mentioned, uh -huh. getting the, the, the some of the, even at least the basic um, surveys translated, is that something you have to do through resources, or if people that were that you know, I mean, is it a volunteer thing? If you had someone that could do it, it can be done, or does it have well, to be channels because of the right and one. Um, at one point, I had a student that was working with me on the project who was a fluent speaker. Um, she was from Santa Domingo. And she actually worked with one of the Spanish linguistic folks here on campus. And that's where they started um, tr doing the translation. But what we hit as a problem, is, and we know this even with English. You know, the English we speak here is different than what they speak in Australia and different than what they speak in England. So they got, we got kind of stuck in trying to translate some of the medical terms because we weren't even sure if they had terms for it in Spanish or have a term that everyone would understand. Um, because there are words that, that, are, that come from English that other languages don't have, so they just use the English term kind of a thing, and you'd have to describe it. Um, so that was, that's one thing that slows it down. The other thing is I do have to go through a human subjects review on everything I do, which is not a big deal, because all of the trice materials have already been approved. But there's an additional step for translation to then make sure a native speaker also reviews it and says that it's it. what it says it is. Um, so I had a letter from this linguistics professor attesting to it being, you know, a quote, good translation. Um, but we were going to go over it one more time, and then we haven't gotten it online yet. 
so that's in process. But if there are folks out there that can tap into um, helping us with other languages or trying to even translate the full survey, which is a huge, you know, you guys have taken it. It is huge. Um, we figured we'd get the modified done first. And, and see if we can get that rolling. But if there's any help out there or any connections, I am more than happy to follow up to try to get some translations out there. Because we know there's a huge group in Japan. We've, we've learned that from um, the literature. There's a whole pocket of folks in Japan working with survivors. But you know, I don't know Japanese. <laughs> so. That's a stretch. So, well, and that's actually you know, how this is going to get done. It's going to be the right person is going to step up at the right time. Mm -hmm. so. You know, when the right time is there, they'll be there. So cool. That's exact. That's that's interesting. So um, I don't see any other questions over there, and I'm guessing that's because you did just an incredible overview of of the project. So with yeah. that, I'm going to say thank you very much again, Debbie, for taking your time not only today but just ongoing because it means sure. the world to 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 our world. I can tell you that, and we're so glad you're part of our world. Um, and so here's I'm going to tell you guys. Um, tomorrow, we don't, I'm not going to be doing two of these a week most of the time, but tomorrow, you heard Debbie mention um, Cheryl Crozier, uh, Simon's mom. She's going to be doing, um, she's going to be speaking about Simon and her story and their journey. And um, actually, I'm kind of going through my mind. I'd really love to get the two of you to maybe do what you've been doing together, and we can talk about that mm -hmm. later off camera. I'll say, we can use technology, and we can do it out by you, so... Yep, we're trying to get connected with hospitals as they do training. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Well, that's awesome. And so I think knowing the list of people that are watching this live, I know that their brain energy is going right now, and there's going to be something that's going to happen just based on the brain energy that's happening in the background. That being said, um, I appreciate yep. it. We're going to go ahead and I want to let you guys know. Not only do we have um, Simon, we have um, Cheryl and Simon tomorrow. Um, and you can, I'm going to put the link up for that. If you're not already registered, I'll put the link up when we close down tonight or today. Um, I also really want to encourage you to be connected with SOS. Go to trisomy.org. Get registered for the conference if you're not. If it's, I don't even know if registration is up, but be watching for it because really um, it is where the family comes together. So with that, uh, go to the website. If you haven't been to trisomytalk.com, there are things starting to be up there. Dr. Carey's uh, talk is up there. Uh, this will be up there in just a, a day or two. In fact, maybe tonight if I have some time when I get back later. And um, from there, we're going to have, um, we've got videos and pictures going up. And I'm just really excited about where we're going to be able to take this project. So, Debbie, again, thank you, everyone, for taking your time and joining us today. I appreciate that. And we'll see everybody tomorrow. Have a good